Welcome to Houston Newsmakers Extra, Dr. Peter Hotez, the Dean of the Tropical School of Medicine at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Hotez, you cl clearly, vaccines is your wheelhouse, if you will. Um, as you take this vaccine and you're working on a vaccine for this, how frustrating is it for you in terms of trying to develop? I know that there was a SARS vaccine in the works and it there was never a vaccine in place for that. W this time, do you suspect that the rise in the level of our attention about these diseases is going to help you get to the finish line with this one? Well, I sure hope so. Uh, you know, what we've done is I've devoted my life to developing vaccines for neglected, what we call neglected tropical diseases, diseases of the poor. And then we got this great opportunity to build a vaccine center at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. It's called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development where we're developing vaccines for diseases that most people have never heard of in the U.S., diseases like schistosomiasis and Chagas disease. And I co-direct that with my science partner of 20 years, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi. Uh, and, and that's been fabulous. And then about a decade ago, uh, we're not virologists, actually. We work mainly on parasitic disease vaccines, but we, got a, we approached a group, uh, we got introduced to a group at the New York Blood Center that had been really pioneering early stage uh, coronavirus vaccines. And they had a, an idea of how they could make a vaccine both uh, that works and is, is also has some uh, built in safety features. And we partnered with them, wrote a grant to the NIH, uh, got it funded. And then we partnered with the Galveston National Lab and Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and developed a, our first coronavirus vaccines. We have two now and we think one of them to be repurposed to also fight against COVID-19. So we're hoping that we can be in clinical trials later this year. So as all of this progresses, and there are obviously needs for people to want to get answers about the health risk involved, and there are also needs from politicians and leadership to get the country back open again, how frustrating is it for you to see the level of partisan politics kind of making its way into uh, pandemic protection, if you will? Well, to actually, the truth is, um, it's it's probably more revved up now than I've seen it in the past because we're in an election cycle and uh, there's a lot of posturing going on. So it, there are some toxic politics going on. The truth is, it's always been this way. I mean, I, I saw this with anthrax in 2001, if you remember the anthrax attacks in Washington. And right. Then it was SARS, the original SARS in 2003, and then it was... H1N1 in 2009, and the list goes on. Mears in 2012, Ebola 2014, Zika in 2016, and and now this. So the, there's always a, quite a bit of overlay of politics, and and that's been a great learning experience for me is how you thread that needle and show politicians on both sides that uh, you you only want to do what's best for for humankind. And I had one of the greatest experiences I had was uh, President Obama in 2015. 2016 appointed me as U.S. Science Envoy to uh, build vaccine development capability in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, there's some real politics there. <laughs> so after uh, dealing with Su Sunni Shia rivalries, uh, anything down in this part of the world uh, looks like a small potato. But, <laughs> uh, but it's still significant. That it does. Hey, I saw some information last week I thought was very interesting. It was that talking about the United States, that it has 4% of the world population, but in terms of COVID-19 uh, cases may have as much as 30 some odd percent of that. Uh, that was eye-opening to me. Why do you think that is? If you believe that that is true, uh, why do you think that is? Well, there's a certain amount of the fact that we do a lot, we've now gearing up for a lot of testing, so we're picking up a lot of cases, uh, but there's no question that this virus snuck into the country in early February, way before we were really doing testing or even thinking it was a threat. And we know when transmission goes on undetected for a long time, that's when you see a big surge. And unfortunately that's happened in, in the United States uh, uh, currently. So we've got, uh, you know, I think the numbers are over a million cases now. And and then th those numbers are probably much higher. Um, we're probably only picking up maybe one in 10 cases in the US. So the real number is probably closer to 10 or even 20 million cases in the United States, but it's not gonna stop here. Uh, we're already seeing what's going on in Latin America, the horror stories coming out of Brazil and especially some of the Northern cities, Fortaleza and Belém and 
Manaus, and that's going to be devastating. We're seeing what's happening in Guayaquil and Ecuador. As we move into the summer months, I think this will pick up in the Southern Hemisphere. We'll start, start seeing in India and Africa. So um, uh, the worst is yet to come, unfortunately, in terms of the global pandemic. Dr. Fauci has indicated that he expects it to fully be around here in the fall as well. You agree with that? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, my colleagues at, at Harvard School of Public Health are predicting uh, a big wave coming in January around the winter months because they've seen this with other coronavirus infections. So I think we'll see a, see a spike then. But the thing I'm most worried about in the nearest future is the fact that because in many states like Texas, we've relaxed social distancing ahead of time uh, when the models tell us we can do it safely uh, means that we will have a resurgence of COVID-19 in Texas probably later this summer or fall as well. So there'll be a second intermediate. Well, we'll keep track of all that. Uh, we certainly, uh, it's uh, comforting to know that you're on the job trying to find the answer to these things. It's uh, your life work is our, we the beneficiaries of your life work. Thank you, Dr. Hotez, for what you do. Uh, my congratulations to all of you and your colleagues for what you're doing now ahead of time for what I know is gonna be a positive outcome going forward. Thank you, Doc, appreciate you. Well, well, thank you, and I appreciate your giving attention to all of these issues and, and aspects. And I always love your bow tie, so, too. Thank you very much for keeping... Thank you. I, I can't see you, but I'm sure you got it on. So. <laughs> you know I do, brother. <laughs> thank you, sir. You take care.